Good morning. Welcome to this online service. This is but a pre recorded portion of what we provide every Sunday at our two locations in Asheville and Hendersonville. In Hendersonville, we have a 9 30 service with family Bible time to follow. And in our Asheville location, we have two services, 8 a.m. and 10 15 a.m., with family Bible time right in the middle. It starts at 9 15 a.m. for all ages. We would love to be able to share in that time with you. There's hardly anything that's better than growing in God's word together with your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. If, if you're new to this, we also would encourage you to look more on our website, to be able to check out opportunities on our calendar, and even to reach out to Pastor Zell, to our pastoral intern, Jacob Ungamak, or to me. We would love to be able to meet with you, to share God's word with you, to answer any questions you have, or even just to pray with you. The service today is part of this series entitled Wounds That Heal. Our Savior, like a surgeon, pulls out the scalpel and he does give us wounds through his words, but not so that we would bleed out or only be harmed, but actually for our good. Just as a surgeon cuts for the good of the patient, so too our Savior cuts out these things that are injurious to our souls. Particularly today, we are going to see him encourage all of us to count the cost. What does it mean to be a disciple? Since this is the most important thing, not only in earth, but in heaven, that we would follow our Savior, is it just a cakewalk? Is it a, a smooth and easy path? Or is our Savior being honest and even challenging us to assess our lives as his followers? Yes, that is certainly the case. May God bless our time in his word today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Lord God invites us to approach him with humility, reverence, sincerity, and also transparency. Since he alone knows our thoughts and intentions even better than us, then we would do well to confess our sins to him quietly and privately, pleading to him and trusting in him for mercy and forgiveness that he provides through his son, Jesus Christ. Let us do so now. God, our Father in heaven, sent his one and only Son, Jesus Christ, to live the perfect life we never could, and to die the death that we never would, so that in his death on the cross, he would remove our guilt, and having been raised from the dead, he would claim for us forgiveness, pardon, peace, and eternal life. And so I say to you what God says to you. Your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O merciful Lord, you did not spare your only Son, but delivered him up for us all. Grant us courage and strength to take up the cross and follow him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. In our Old Testament reading, God, through Moses, is calling the people of Israel to consider the cost of following. And Moses doesn't blow any soft words here. In fact, he cuts them right to the heart, telling them that this is a matter of life and death. Our Old Testament reading, Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life, so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word of the Lord. The gospel reading for today from Luke chapter 14 will serve as the basis for the sermon today. 
Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit for neither the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a story that I heard from um, a man who was a physician here in town for a while before moving away. And he was talking about a surgery that was performed. And this surgery had a huge effect, not just on the, the patient, but on his family members. Because nobody knew that he had this problem. Several symptoms, very severe symptoms, arose. I won't get into the gory details. And this person, this gentleman, was brought to the ER. And they had no idea what was going on. He was doing more than just throwing a fever and convulsing. It was pretty dire. And after operating on him and figuring out what was, what was wrong in, in carrying out this operation, all of his family was floored. They had no idea. And this patient had no idea that this issue was wrong with him. It was like a ghost. It was like a, a silent killer working inside of him. Now, I don't recall exactly what it was that this man suffered from, because when I heard the story from this surgeon, the thing that he told me was that every single one of the family members, there were three of them that stayed that whole day and into the next day, they, they also wanted to talk to this doctor and they all had the same question. How can I be sure how can I be sure that this same thing isn't going to happen to me? And, and that was the most memorable thing. The reason why he told me this story was because he could still see their faces. He could see the concern. They were horrified and wondering if they might be next. And if it wasn't this very thing, whatever it was, they wondered if it was something else lurking inside of them, some flaw, some disease, some parasite, something. And they were postulating on all, could it be this? Could, could I str struggle with this? They were hypothesizing all of these crazy things with him in the room there. And he, he kind of had to talk them all off the ledge. No, I'm not going to perform surgery on all of you. Cut you open just to see if there's something wrong with you. That's not how it works. But you can understand at least a little bit why they kind of hopped on the crazy train for a moment. Because maybe it wasn't all that crazy to think if this guy was fine, everything was going okay, and then suddenly there is this devastating thing that creeps out of nowhere and he didn't even know that he had it, then all of a sudden he's wide open on an operating table. Could, could that same thing be true of me? It's almost like you're not worried only about a loved one who's having surgery. You're wondering if one day, whether you knew it, or in this case, especially if you're not aware of it, would that be you too? that you didn't really know of something that needed to be cut out? That's exactly what God wants us to consider today through his word. It might not be often where we're put in a life or death situation, where we have to make a call, so to speak, on a type of surgery that needs to be performed on our heart or on our brain or our spine or something. But there is a type of life or death scenario that our Savior calls us to see, not only in others, but also to ponder and consider in ourselves. No, this isn't a surgery that requires a scalpel, but the Spirit himself, through these words, desires to cut these out. Yet, no less than Jesus himself possesses the scalpel of his word today. And, it's, and it hurts, and it's not easy to listen to, but here's the rub. He needs to cut something out so that we would not only recognize this thing to begin with, but that we would be better for it. As you can tell, it 
It matches with all of the readings we've been hearing thus far in this series entitled Wounds That Heal. Our Savior wants to cut something out of us because he knows it's not for our spiritual betterment. He knows that it is not for our eternal good. And so what is that for us today? Could it be that each and every one of us needs to consider the cost, the expense, the sacrifice, the requirement, the self-assessment of following Jesus? Since this is the most important thing that we can do, not only in this life, but into eternity, do we th suppose that this is going to be the easiest thing? Jesus makes very clear, absolutely not. And so he encourages us to evaluate for ourselves what this type of self-applied pre-surgery might be. That's certainly what the original hearers needed to consider, too. There are several commentators that talk about the people who are following Jesus at this time. You, you heard at the beginning of the reading, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And as they're, they're traveling him, with him, why are they traveling with him? Well, up to this point, he had had wonderful words to say that had turned the religious uh, bullying upside down. This burdensome preaching that they had to be good enough. Jesus came and, and turned that all upside down to, to preach about a, a Savior, a God who came for us and is not against us. A God who helps us in our need and saves us by his mercy. He doesn't expect us to climb our, our way to heaven. He had not only challenged these Pharisees and, and put some of them in their place, he had performed miracles that could only come from God. Healing the sick, giving sight to the blind. The deaf could hear, the lame could walk. And so now along the way, these large crowds are following him. And you can imagine we too, we would follow him too. Seeing and hearing things we had never heard before. Experiencing peace and seeing miracles, the likes of which our world has never seen, at least with our own eyes. And of all the things Jesus can say to them, it's not that Jesus doesn't want people to follow him. He knows that they are following him because, well, for many of them, and to a large degree, this is an easy road thus far. Everything's going smoothly. It's easy to follow the guy who always has the right words to say. He's always in a position of power. He always gives you peace when you need it. He also can cure diseases. He, he's, he's like a walking everything man. And, and why wouldn't you follow him? But Jesus knows that that's not the way that this life works, which is not going to be everything for us that we need it to be. God wants us to be in heaven with him where we belong. And so we need to see this world for what it is, which is always going to be against our Savior and everyone who follows him. And so... He knows that some of these people have this romantic idea that following Jesus is just going to be great. And might I add, that's no different than today. How many people today around us, and maybe even we ourselves at times, think that by becoming a Christian, our lives automatically get easier? Like this is the time where God starts rolling out some blessings. We kind of have this quid pro quo agreement with God. If we don't say it, we still might think it that, Lord, if I follow you, then I can expect some kickback from God. And if I do these steps with my children, then they will do this for me and also for themselves. If I give my offerings, then God will bless me more financially. If I serve him and follow him, then I will expect that things will go better for me. He will help me against my enemies, etc., etc. Is that really how life goes? God never promised that. Through his son, our Savior Jesus, what he did promise is that anyone who would follow Jesus must deny their life in this world and follow him. Isn't that what Jesus got right, at, right, at, right out the gate? As he's talking to all of these people, he wants to make clear that this romantic idea of following Jesus for a better, happier, blissful, more comfortable and convenient life is just a myth. Instead, if anyone's going to follow him, what will it take? He says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate their father, mother, wife, children, brothers or sisters, yes, even their own life, they can't be one of his disciples, but one of his followers. Now, First of all, it's important to understand when Jesus says these things or says anything, what is he not saying? Jesus is not all of a sudden taking the commandments and tossing them out the back window. He's not taking something like the fourth commandment where you're supposed to honor your father and mother and now he's saying, nope, we're going to switch that around again. You're supposed to dishonor them. That's not what he's saying. 
He's not saying that you don't need to have a good relationship with your brothers and sisters anymore. When you become a follower, you can just kind of forget your brothers and sisters, by the way, especially the one that might get on your nerves. That might be a little easier. No, 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 no. that's not what he's saying. He, he's not saying that when it comes to your wife and your children, whom you are called to take care of, by the way, to cherish and to uphold, that, that for husbands, for your wife, you are to love her more than you love yourself. You are to be so sacrificial. You are to be like Jesus. He's not all now all of a sudden changing his tune. No, 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 no. Nor is he changing his tune on your own life, like hating your life, like what we're supposed to like hurt ourselves now and not care. No, no, no. Jesus is not taking the fifth commandment and throwing that out either. That we, we're supposed to honor life, which means taking care of our own life too. That's not what he's saying. So what is he saying then? He's putting himself in a juxtaposed position to all of these other relationships. If at the end of the day, you still are looking more and more to your parents for all of the value and recognition and identity that you strive for in life, as opposed to Jesus, that's not going to work. If you find your greatest source of love and affirmation and belonging in your spouse and not in Jesus, in your children and not in Jesus, that's not going to work. If you claim to follow Jesus, and yet you still look to your family or to your friends for, for the greatest source of relationship that you could ever hope for in this life. That's not going to work. There's no halfway 50%. There's not even this 90% way of following Jesus. He's saying there is one position that resides at the top of your heart. There's only one spot up there. There's not many seats. There's one seat. And who is it who sits there? Your family? Your friends? Your spouse? Your kids? You yourself? Your own life? If you really want to follow Jesus, you need to understand that he, and he alone, gets that spot. He alone sits in that seat. That doesn't mean we despise and hurt or hate um, ourselves or any of those other relationships. It, it just does mean, though, however, that they do not take the place of Jesus. And so what might that look like in your life? Well, what if the time comes as a follower of Jesus that you are called to take a stand for something that Jesus says? Say it's to one of your siblings, a brother or a sister, or maybe it's one of your parents. It would be much easier to just keep the peace. It would be much easier, if, especially if, let's say, even they're, they're a Christian. And especially as a Christian, they know better than to behave in the way that they're behaving. Whether it's setting aside part of God's word, whether it's carrying out a certain behavior that is clearly opposite of what God has designed and desires for them. And they just go along, and, and, and there's going to come a point in time where, I, I'm not saying you've got to be that sidewalk preacher with a cardboard sign and you've got to hit him up over the head with him. That, that typically doesn't work. But what I am saying is, there's going to come a time where, in, in that scenario, where you are struggling, struggling and wrestling between two realities. Either you just keep the peace and let things go. They can mind their own business and just let, let them do them. Or, knowing exactly what Jesus has called you to know, and what has called them to know, and the way he's called them to live, you might say something. But that might hurt your relationship with them. Even so, what do you care about in that scenario? That, that might be a tough scenario to consider. Maybe consider another one. Let's say somebody close to you is encouraging you to live out in a way that you know is not in line with God's word. It might be quite convenient and even popular in our modern day, but still, you know exactly what God says and what he desires. So it might hurt your relationship and you might lose opportunities to hang out with friends or family members if you said no and if you even gave the reason why. But the reason why might be that you love your Savior. You appreciate what he says in his word. And so to follow him first and foremost might mean that you would affirm to them that they do not get that first place in your head, in your heart, and in your life. That's what Jesus is saying. And so as he's talking to all of these people, do you think that this is dawning on them, that this is a really easy thing to consider? Like, oh yeah, I've, uh, sure. I mean, if Jesus asked me, um, I, I would follow him. The, the truth of the matter is that I don't think any of us are ever going to be put into a real life position where it is either I choose to live, someone's got the gun to my head or the knife to my throat, and I have to, they're calling me to disavow Jesus, and I'm going to say, I believe in Jesus. The truth of the matter is, the way that things are going this far, it, it could change, but we're probably not going to lose our life for being a follower of Jesus. 
Maybe I'm wrong. I hope I'm, I hope I'm right. But maybe I'm wrong. Even so, Jesus is saying this to everyone because he wants them to consider it. He's saying to all of them, are, are you not considering that? And then he creates these two scenarios. Like, what, what builder is not going to count the cost first and have the plans and does this work in the budget? Or what king, when you're considering not just, just building supplies and, and monetary costs, but you're now considering the cost of life itself, what king is going to send people off to battle without wondering whether or not he's got the men and he's got the guns in order to take the other person down and win? So as Jesus is inviting everyone else to consider this, it's kind of like, it's kind of like that man that's on the operating table. Once you hear about this operation that's going on among all of these people who are following Jesus with this romantic idea that everything is going to get better, with it, you then start to ask yourself, I wonder, I wonder what Jesus would say if he were here today. Well, he would say this. We might not have kings that take people off to war, but we know exactly what it's like in our own country's history to go off to wars that we don't necessarily win or have a decisive victory over. Those things always leave a bad taste in everyone's mouth. And we become very critical of those in charge, right? Well, Jesus says, so it is, in the same way those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. So what would it cost you today? I don't know tomorrow or maybe even, not even today what it might cost you, but what does it say as, as you consider this for yourself? He's now no longer talking to this crowd. And he says, if, he's not saying like he did earlier in verse 26, if anyone, if anyone, this other person, as you think, well, if anyone does that, well, yeah, they should probably consider that. That person over there, it'd be really good for them to consider whether or not they really are a disciple of Jesus. You know, that person over there. If anyone. He goes on later after these parables and he says, in the same way those of you. So, so as Jesus asks you to consider this today, I don't know what this looks like in your life, but I know what it looks like in mine. It's really easy for me at times to consider God's word as something that's part of a profession instead of something that I need every single day. So are there times when my devotional life can lack and wane? Absolutely. And why? Well, because some other task, some other item, some other appointment became much more important or got that priority. And what does that say? as I seek to follow my Savior who should alone have that first place priority in my heart and in my life. When I look to other people, whether, whether it be my spouse, my wife, whether it be friends, whether it be brothers in the ministry whom I value, wh whether it's my own kids, I, I look to them for things that I need and all the while I forget that the Savior who loves me has given me absolutely everything that I need. I look to them more than I would look to the one who's already given me everything that I need in himself, Jesus Christ. I don't know what that looks like for you. But what if it was a family member who just came out of the operating room and you find out that it, there was this terrible thing going on and you had no idea. And right in that moment you thought to yourself, could this happen to me? Is this genetic? Like if it's a sibling who just got out of the operating room? Uh, it, what do I need to consider? That's exactly what you need to do. That is exactly what your Savior is calling you to do. He's not just asking you to consider some people in some distant time or some faraway location who need to consider this self-applied surgery of sorts, spiritual surgery. He's asking you. Why? Because he knows, Jesus knows that he needs to cut out every form of a default towards complacency. Every sort of resorting to comfortability in this life. Everything that makes us cling to the here and now and it pulls us away from that narrow pathway that follows our Savior. Because he knows that those things are never going to do it for us in the end. So, so what is that for you? Analyze your life. Look at your calendar. I mean, it, most of us have it all online or maybe you do write it out. Uh, write it out. What does your calendar say about the amount of time and priority you give to your Savior? What about when it comes to a Sunday morning or a Saturday night? Are you, are you those families that actually ask the question, are we going to go to, are we going to go tomorrow? Think of how weird that question is. 
Like, are we actually going to go spend time in God's word and be encouraged by the blessings that could only come from above? And I wonder, I wonder really if that's as important as the other things we're going to do. I, I know it's really harsh for me to say it that way, but I'm not sorry because someone has to. I mean, well, what does it say when we would resort to do anything else except for being in God's word? Or even as you approach Monday or Wednesday, Thursday or Saturday, and you consider everything that you're doing that day, and, and when is that time in that day or how much time in that week are, are you going to spend prioritizing and living out the word of grace that your Savior has given you? Breakfast is the most important meal of the day for your body. What's the most important meal of the day for your soul? The morning news? Checking up on your Twitter or Facebook feed? Maybe it's even just a tiny morsel of God's word. It doesn't have to take more than a couple minutes. But by chewing on that, God promises to give you blessings unparalleled and wisdom unfound in this world. What does it say when we are called to evaluate part of our lives that are so near and dear to us and our first reaction is not to say, well, what does God have to say about that? But our first reaction is, I don't feel or I don't like or this is what other people say. What's going on in our heads? E evaluate that. I don't know what that is. I don't know what's going on in your own head and heart. But I think I can say that I've talked to enough people that this goes on in their heads and their hearts. And I am not ashamed to say this goes on in mine. I'm no different. So why does Jesus want us to consider this? Because he doesn't want us to be that person who didn't even know was never asked to consider, and in the end, it only meant spiritual harm, if not worse. Instead, he wants us to take this, pre, go, go through this pre-surgery exam, so to speak, to self-apply these ponderings of ourselves. Why? So that, first of all, we can see that we all have a lot of evaluating to do. We all have a lot of work to do. So do I. But, why else does Jesus say this? So we would listen to the only one, the one who is speaking, who did this for us. You, 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 you consider for a second the Savior Jesus, who, when God gave his son, who was God the Father thinking about? He was thinking about you. When Jesus was forgiving instead of biting back at, and fighting back at people, chirping back at those that were abusing him with his, their words and worse, when Jesus was loving others, when Jesus was giving up his spirit, when Jesus was allowing himself to be nailed, when Jesus was suffering hell in our place, who was he thinking about? He's thinking about you. So that God would forsake his son. And what father would give up their son for strangers or enemies? Our father in heaven would. Our father in heaven did. And in this way, God gave his son over for every single time we would never put him first so that in the end, God would take us from the lows and bring us to the heights. He would take us from this bad reality of misplacing our priorities, and he would show us that by his grace, in the person and work of Jesus Christ, he has put us as his highest priority, retaining in himself this vision that we are the apple of his eye, we are the desire of his heart, that he, he seeks to draw us in and under the shadow of his saving and enduring wings. Look no farther than the one who is speaking this to you. He's not holding some giant machete to hurt you. He's holding a scalpel to wound in order to heal you. Consider what this might look like then moving forward in your life. Jesus says, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It looks like salt. It maybe feels like salt. But if you put it on some food, it wouldn't taste like salt. There's kind of a waste of space at that point. And really, you don't want someone else to use it and to, to expect the benefit from it. And so what good is it if there, it doesn't have that saltiness on the inside, that usefulness, that benefit? So it is with you. God says if, if you consider what's going on in your life, what great benefit do you have internally and spiritually? And how does the evaluation follow that would enable you to grow in that regard? Maybe it looks like this. Maybe it looks like you taking your entire calendar and you considering for yourself, what is my life mostly about? And then you ask yourself another question, your second question. What has God given me? 
And then you'd ask yourself a third question. Where does God welcome me? And I think if you follow that, what, what has God given me? You, you see what your life is, what is my life all about? What has God given me? All the things you have to do, all the stuff you take care of. And then where does God welcome me? You would see, not even hidden, but right there on your own calendar, I dare you to find, I, I dare you to open up your calendar to me and say, well, there's, and I didn't see anything. No, 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 no. Every single one of us would find an ample opportunities where God welcomes us. Where God welcomes us to hear what? Beatings? Burdensome? Guilt-ridden? Messages to hurt our hearts? Even for, No. Messages of guidance and comfort so we would be better for it. Messages of grace and peace to make us of spiritual betterment, benefit not only to ourselves but to the, for the people around us. I mean, what do you think is going to happen when there's a person next in your life who needs forgiveness from you? What is that forgiveness like unless you know what the forgiveness of God is like? What is it going to be like when you are going to need wisdom from someone else? Wisdom that's not just found in this world, but wisdom that comes from God. Where are you going to go? Well, don't you also have that wisdom that you can share with others? What about the next time someone is going to need from you guidance and encouragement? Someone's going to need from you guidance and encouragement to navigate, whether it's relationships, job decisions, moving, parenting, marriage. God has plenty to say on all of that, and he gives you the wisdom in his word that you could point others to it. He also has given that to other people too, so ample opportunity abounds? Absolutely. On, on this Sunday, it's called Grow Sunday, where we relaunch brand new Bible studies and Sunday school curriculum for all of the kids. It's a time when we roll out new groups, chances for us to grow in God's word. And of all the things that I think you can't say, you can't say not only when you look at your calendar, but our church calendar, I don't, I don't know if there's any opportunity for me to follow my Savior in his word. The question is, can we evaluate that? Can we welcome this instruction from the surgeon of our hearts himself, Jesus Christ. And then when we do, God's desire for us is to then follow in the pathway of our Savior who only provides blessings unfound, who only gives us peace unparalleled, who only rolls out forgiveness that is undiscovered in this world, and who only gives us grace and zeal to follow in the pathway of our Savior. May God grant you a life that welcomes this self-assessment this pre-surgery, so to speak, so that as you analyze yourself, you would follow your Savior, even if it meant great cost of anything else. For in the end, what your Savior gives you is worth it. God grant that to you all. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this time. We would love to be able to share more of God's word with you. Please do reach out to Pastor Zell, to our vicar, our pastoral intern, Jacob Ungamak, or to myself. We'd love to be able to meet you for coffee, no strings attached, so that we can share God's grace with you and even learn more about your story and to pray with you. Throughout our entire week, every single week, there's plenty of opportunities to grow in God's word. Please check out our calendar. Check out more opportunities on our website. We'd love to be able to connect with you. God's grace go with you as your Savior seeks to guide you on the pathway to our heavenly home. Take care.